All right, well, welcome everyone. So pleased to see you all here. So thank you for coming. Um, as you know, we begin every event of significance at Mount Holyoke College with a land acknowledgement. So I will begin that way. Mount Holyoke College begins each event in the life of the college by acknowledging that those of us in Western Massachusetts are occupying the ancestral land of the Nanatuck people. We also acknowledge the neighboring indigenous nations, the Nipmuc and the Wampanoag to the east, the Mohegan and Pequot to the south, the Mohican to the west, and the Abenaki to the north. We encourage every member of our community to learn about the original inhabitants of the land where they reside. The impact of settler colonization contributed to the displacement, removal, and attempted genocide of indigenous peoples. This land acknowledgement seeks to verbalize Mount Holyoke's commitment to engage in shared responsibility as part of our collective humanity. We urge everyone to participate in action steps identified by the indigenous community-based in organ organizations. Thank you. And again, thank you for coming. I am personally very excited to be in conversation with two dynamic graduates of the Psychology and Education Department of Mount Holyoke College. And um, I can say that we've got quite a few psychology faculty in the house. Um, we're very excited by that. And of course, some wonderful students and faculty from other departments. But I also want to acknowledge that one of our graduates, Sharice Pickron, is joined here today by her parents and her grandmother. So we want to say a special thank you for them for coming. We're so pleased you could be here. And <laughs> so it's just um, very exciting for me for lots of reasons. You're going to hear why um, to launch this launching leadership conversation with two dynamic graduates, as I said, of the psychology and education department. Dr. Kira Hudson-Banks, class of 2000. I'll tell you more about Kira in just a minute. And Dr. Sharice Pickron, class of 2008. And they both are um, psychologists I knew when they weren't psychologists yet. <laughs> 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 so it's really exciting to me to uh, be able to see them in this um, wonderful phase of their careers. What Kira and Sharice have in common is they are both using their expertise in psychology to impact public understanding and dialogue about the impact of race and racism on young children and what we can do about it. Kira co-founded the Institute for Healing Justice at St. Louis University, where she is a professor in the Department of Psychology. She also served as a racial equity consultant for the Ferguson Commission and continued as the racial equity catalyst for Ford through Ferguson. Her research, teaching, and facilitation around equity, diversity, and inclusion have helped frame racial equity in the St. Louis region and beyond. Really excitingly, she's going to talk about this. She not only does those things, um, but she and has a podcast she's going to tell us about called Raising Equity, but she consults regularly with media outlets such as Nickelodeon, HBO, HBO Max, and Pixar. So we'll hear more about that. Sharice is a developmental psychologist and an assistant professor at the University of Minnesota's Institute of Child Development where her work examines the way early experiences shape the perceptions and representations of people that vary along race and gender. Her work as a president's postdoctoral fellow examined attentional processes sensitive to facial expressions using electrophysiological measures, also known as EEG and ERPs, <laughs> as well as eye tracking. Her goal is to actively work with families of diverse backgrounds to build a collaborative bridge between communities in the Minneapolis area and her work in child development. Sharice is also taking her work in psychology into the public square, and I had the pleasure of hearing her on Minnesota Public Radio talking about her research with babies and how they come to recognize and understand race. So we have two media stars here. <laughs> I'm really excited about the fact that they've both been using um, 
their knowledge to translate science into everyday applications, and so we're going to talk about that. But we're going to start with Kira. And in the spirit of full disclosure, I've known Kira since she was a first year student in yeah. my psychology class yeah. back in uh, 1996. Yes. On the first day of class, I talked about my research, and Kira said, I'd like to know more about your research. And she came to my office, and the rest is history. <laughs> so, um, so it's very exciting to see Kira back here. But what we really want to know, Kira, is how have you gone from you know, being a professor at St. Louis University to Hollywood. No. <laughs> <laughs> you tell it us sounds about exciting. that. Sounds <laughs> exciting. Um, I just want to first say thanks so much for having me. It's really beautiful to see everyone here, and I want to give people hugs and nice to be back here in this space. And I'm, in some ways, I don't know, but in other ways, when I slow down, I do know how I made that leap, right? But I also want to credit. I think the reason I was able to make that leap is because of you and learning from you. So when I said I was interested in your research, it was because your book then on black families and white communities was my story, right? Growing up in a predominantly white suburb of St. Louis. And so I, you gave me language for my experience on racial identity. And so I started to get curious and you introduced me to Dr. Bill Cross and his research and him. And so I think the way that I made the leap was that I was watching you in psychology of racism and other spaces. And while you were writing, why are, the black, why are all the black kids, translate the theories that we were learning in the class to the lay public. So I, I, I honestly, I do, I credit you in that sense. I've been doing that translational work forever. And so when George Floyd's murder happened and the world paid attention in a way it hadn't before, right? There have always been ebbs and flows, like you mentioned the Ferguson, Ferguson Commission. Yeah. So Mike Brown was killed in St. Louis, that's where I am. That region, right, had a reckoning, um, but George Floyd was on another level. We can talk about, we can have a whole conversation about why. I had been doing the work. I had been working in different spheres, helping people understand their ideals about racism and what they wanted to do and put it into action. And I don't actually, so the reason I say I don't know why is I don't know why Hollywood at that moment. But I got so many calls from, it was Pixar, HBO, HBO Max, Warner Media, Warner Brothers, Broadway. Like, I think there was something about that moment that made them realize, oh, we're not just these free spirits doing creative things, that we have problems too. I don't know why they thought they were exempt, but they did. <laughs> and. I was able to talk to them. I was able to help them. But you know, even as you say that, Kira, they didn't just find you. I mean, you weren't just, you know, you were findable. And part of the reason you were findable, I'm thinking, is because of your presence on social media, and in particular, the Raising Equity podcast. That might be, right. So in a way, uh, my husband, Aaron, who is kind of my partner in this work now, um, we started the podcast because he was, he was basically saying, this is like free advertising for you and what you do. Mm -hmm. Have the podcast, you talk to people, help people understand that you help people. I joke, it's kind of the Olivia Pope side of my work. <laughs> 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 There's problems, I can come help you fix it. We're using a psychological frame and evidence-based work. And um, so yeah, the podcast, I think, and the Institute as well. Mm -hmm. So I've always been trying to say, we have these ideas, we shouldn't keep them in the ivory tower. Mm -hmm. And so that moment allowed me to make the leap. And that work, honestly, has helped shape how some studios do productions from pitch to post, thinking about what equity, diversity, inclusion means from the moment you conceive of an idea, when you develop it, when you cast it, when you, the, in the crew, um, through, through the whole arc. And so it's been, it's been really fun to shape, you know, just to see ways in which Hollywood thinks they're doing everything right because they put some token person in a position and have them realize, oh wait, that's, that's not enough. That representation matters, yes. And we have to think about how we shape the story, right? We don't always want people of color to be the side story. We wanna know where they live and who their family are just as much as we wanna know about the main characters. And so it's been, it's been an interesting shift to try to push them to think beyond just numbers and tokens and, and side characters. 
Well, there's more to say about this, and I know we're going to talk more about it, but it's exciting to hear the ways in which your work has evolved um, over this time. But now we're going to turn to Charisse for a moment, um, because Charisse is at an earlier stage in her career, you know, eight years later, graduating from uh, Mount Holyoke in the class of 2008, um, which was a weird time to be graduating, yes. given <laughs> what was, you know, the economy was falling right. apart yeah. and all yeah. of that. It was hard um, to but am I right, you went straight into graduate school? No, no. actually. You, yeah, tell us about yeah. that. Yeah, so um, after, uh, and so as you mentioned, 2008, not an ideal time to be graduating from college <laughs> um, for many folks who are looking for paid positions. But um, I did something that maybe some people would have frowned upon, which is take an unpaid internship <laughs> working in Key Largo, Florida um, at this uh, Dolphin Assisted Therapy Program, which I then um, was actually kind of one thing that I realized is that it sparked the research question even more. This idea of needing research and understanding processes was started at Mount Holyoke, but this kind of internship experience even got me more in excited about this idea of research. So after that, I then worked at Walt Disney World in Orlando, Florida for for two years and then um, uh, was accepted into a post-baccalaureate research program that was funded by the National Institute of Health and uh, NSF, National Science Foundation. And so between those, that's how I got into the research and into Thank grad school. Thank you for school. reminding me about yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. so it, there's some, you know, I'm not, I wasn't just the academic track, um, which I think is very valuable. Mm -hmm. Well, tell us about the babies. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, you know, people ask, oh, what do you do? And I say, I do baby science, right? So um, I do research with infants, toddlers, preschoolers. Um, and I think of kind of the research areas that I'm interested in a lot about kind of just a reflection of my life and the questions that I'm asking in terms of exploring and understanding how these tiny little humans who seem to not be able to do a lot actually learn a lot, know a lot, and can do quite a bit mm -hmm. um, that has these lasting things. And it, it's a uh, little bit of a me search, research kind of statement where um, I have parents who you know are interested in early childhood my mom was an early childhood educator and my dad worked in academia as obviously <laughs> you know and so I, I'm now in this kind of like marriage of the two parent <laughs> background um, but uh, also this idea of being able to show parents what their little ones are know like what are they learning and the, the actions that they're doing the decisions that the parents are making have long lasting lifetime experience you know impact and we can say that about nutrition about you know motor development we can say that about you know uh, learning to read or write like there's all sorts of things that that fall under this category of long term impact but what i think is underappreciated is that the people you see the people you interact with how you speak about someone how you label someone by 9 months that is laying foundation for bias mm -hmm. um, when we see that at three or five years of age. So that is kind of the messaging that I'm trying to, one, ex explore, but two, share. Yes, yes. So for those of, so I'm familiar with your research, uh, but for those who aren't, I bet some people are thinking, what do you mean at nine months, right? Yeah. Can, can you, yeah. Can you um, give us an example? Sure, sure. So, Faces, we think of a human face, right? And a lot of times for us who are sighted, who use visual world, we see a face and there's gonna be some millisecond decisions that we make about that face. And we make those really fast decisions because we have our whole lives of experience of seeing faces and then associating meaning with that face, right? So if I see you, I can identify who you are, do I know you, do I not know you, your emotion, your, um, and then I'm gonna go to these social constructs of race and gender, and I'm gonna put categories on that really quickly too, with, and it's subconscious because of our lifetime of experience. But at nine months, that's also happening. <laughs> and then at, by nine months of age, infants are um, becoming really good at face recognition, but particularly the faces that they see the most. 
So they, our brain is um, firing up and paying more attention to the faces that we see on the regular basis because those are the ones that keep us alive, right? Those, right? That, matter. Right. those right. that matter. And our brain is going to start to prune away the connections that are for faces that are less useful in our environment, right? And so between three and nine months of age, there's this dramatic shift in the brain that results in being really good at telling faces that are of a race that we are familiar with and not so good at the faces of races of, that we are less familiar with. And that level at nine months is equal to the level of what adults do, right? So by nine months, they look like grown-ups in some ways based on the experience that they have in their environment. I use your research <laughs> as I teach adults in different spheres yeah. about why race matters. Mm -hmm. Because people want to say, oh, I just see you as an individual. Yeah. It doesn't matter. And I'll say, we have research <laughs> that shows <laughs> that by this month, right, I use it to help people. See. So if babies see it, you can't claim to not see it. Right. So that argument has to fall away and you have to be accountable for what you do see and manage it. Exactly. Yeah. 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 And so the part though then is that nine months they, we see it, infants see it, the social implications of the idea of race or the idea of gender are not solidified at nine months, right. but they're being built. Yeah. Right? So we start with the perceiving. We see a face and we are learning that certain faces are more common. We have positive experiences with our caregivers mostly, right? And that positive affect and association plus being really good at telling my mom's face from a different face leads to these laying of foundations for implicit racial bias and also eventually explicit uh, stereotypes too. So you can see why people want to talk to Sharice on the radio. <laughs> um, and, uh, and I know that Kira is having similar kinds of conversations. What I am interested in sharing with this audience, because I know we have, just raise your hand if you are a psychology student, studying psychology. Most of the students in the room are, and I know we've got quite a few psychology faculty members here, some of whom knew you when you were students. And um, so I just have to brag for a moment. <laughs> I told Sharice I was going to do this, so I don't want to embarrass her, but she's a brand new professor, right, at the University of Minnesota. And, um, and the PhD you got is from UMass, UMass yeah. right? Yeah. UMass Amherst in Developmental Psychology. And, um, and then you did a postdoc, right, in Minnesota. And when Sharice was coming out of her postdoc, she was trying to decide where to work. And she was trying to decide, should she take the job at University of Wisconsin, or Minnesota, or Virginia Tech, <laughs> or Stanford? And <laughs> in the end, she decided to stay in Minnesota. But I just think that for the psychology faculty members, we can all like, you know, shine ourselves up here because that's a great outcome for yep. one of our students. And I think I, I will say the department prepared me well because I was when you were asking did you go straight through I was like you might have been thinking about me. Yes I, know I did. did. Yeah. And it was it, it was odd. It wasn't always a, a given that you could get into a clinical psych program straight through but I, I credit the training that I've received and the research experience I received to be able to go to Michigan. Absolutely. Absolutely. And then from Michigan yeah. What happened after that, Kara? Uh, after Michigan, I went to Illinois Wesleyan University. I went to a small liberal arts college because clearly I love small liberal arts colleges. <laughs> and they prepared me well. I wanted to do the same. And then uh, life brought us at a, at a kind of a transition point and I started to look at other positions and St. Louis University is where I landed. And so that was a shift, having doctoral students rather than just undergrads, um, so it's, it's been a good one though. So tell us about the Institute for Racial Healing. So the Institute for Healing Justice and Equity, it, it's a mouthful, but healing justice is, uh, is a phrase that Kara Page and others have, have pioneered, and actually they just wrote a book, it just came out the last week or so. Are you all familiar with it? Awesome. Yeah. It's been mentioned in the class. Awesome. And so uh, we were excited to think about what does it look like to, to leverage the resources of a research institution for community in a way that's authentic. Because the way that it often happens at universities is 
you say you're partnering with community, but it's extractive. Mm -hmm. It's not true partnership. Mm -hmm. And so um, the Institute is committed to working multidisciplinary across disciplines in community in, in ways that share power with the community. That's great. And, and Charisse, in my introduction of you, one of the things I said about you was that you were also trying to bridge, um, build bridges between communities yeah. and the university. Yeah, so exactly what you're saying is that this we, we want to stop the extraction experience, right? Because um, it's, of course, one-sided. There's only benefit from one. But the questions and research that both of us are interested in are, are doing it because of families or because of community, right? So we should include community in the conversation, in the development of the questions themselves. So. Um, you know, as you said, I'm just kind of getting started. So for me right now, it's um, uh, this, the beginnings of partnership building. Um, so trying to uh, think about either daycare centers or things that there are opportunities for me just to show up and be in that space. So not to say, oh, I'm an expert in this, I know best, but to just show up and be supportive, like hand out the Cheerios or whatever it is, right? So just being there and being in that space. Um, and if there are questions that they, that communities want to ask and I can be a part of it, then that's like that's what I want to see have um, happen. And there's a new um, program in St. Paul, Minnesota, that's called Before Racism. Before Before Racism, and and um, my hope is to start building that conversation with the daycare to because their daycare is all about kind of thinking about before racism starts in terms of development. Getting to those babies. Yeah, getting yeah. to the babies. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, Kira, you used a word when you were talking about the Institute um, and the community connections, and that word was authentic, yes. which of course made me think about a phrase I've been using a lot around here, which is authentic boldness, right? So um, I'm going to just read this question because I ask everyone the same question. This is a phrase that I learned from one of our alums in an interview that I read about, actually. Um, the alum is Sheila Marcello, who's an entrepreneur, very successful entrepreneur. But she described um, her experience of going into offices looking for funding and her need to really enter with a certain kind of self presence mm -hmm. because otherwise she was just being dismissed, mm -hmm. right? And so she talked about. Um, being authentically bold. And this is what she said about it. When you bring your truest self to the table, you are able to be bold in your own authenticity. And it seems to me there's a lot of evidence in listening to each of you um, about that authentic boldness in your journey from South Hadley, Massachusetts <laughs> to what you're doing now. And I'd just like you to reflect on that um, in the sense that what about your Mount Holyoke experience, and it may be different for each of you, mm -hmm. um, might have helped you deepen that sense of authentic boldness? I always joked when I was at Mount Holyoke, because I did my junior year at Spelman on exchange, and it was a great experience. Um, but it gave me an opportunity to experience another institution that there's something in the water here. <laughs> <laughs> like, there's just, so, in a good way, not in a like, <laughs> Um, <laughs> that there's just something in the, in the way that I, it, it, it fed an intellectual curiosity in me that I didn't know needed validating. Mm -hmm. I didn't know I was uh, not confident in that. I thought, I thought I was confident, right? But being here really allowed me to figure out that I was enough in a lot of ways, whether it was women being in leadership positions, whether it was being a black woman leading APAU, whether it was, you know, yeah, it's okay to be a nerd and do your homework before you go out and party, right? Like I had a group of friends and that's what we did. Like we got our work done and we also went and had a lot of fun. And I think it allowed me to, I'm st I would say I'm, I'm still fine tuning it, but it allowed me to step into who I am and to not be apologetic about it. Um, let me say that again because I just went up at the end. It allowed me to step into who I am and not be apologetic and to be unapologetic that, that I have a gift in the way that I do what I do. And I'm a clinical psychologist, but I don't look like other clinical psychologists. But I also do, you know, I do, I do things in a, a little bit of a, a, well, an authentic way, mm -hmm. right? And it seems to work and it seems to impact 
spaces that I enter, and so I've stopped questioning it. And I think Mount Holyoke helped me be able to explore that and also pushed me to, to learn broadly and, and deeply. Mm -hmm. But the liberal arts education, it, it gave me the foundation for who I am. That's great. Thank you. And how about for you, Cherise? So you just put all of that on for donor cards, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's what, That's there we go, right? We need this on for donor cards here. <laughs> um, so I have some similar thoughts on this and feelings really resonate with me with what you said. And by trying, for me, I try to put it in kind of two different buckets. One is that and I know there's like a podcast that says we can do hard things, but Mount Holyoke really, I mean, you, we do hard things <laughs> at Mount Holyoke, but you, and you do it in a way that is true to, that I, I did it in a way that was true to myself. And it was hard, like um, learning and thinking and reading and writing are all hard things for me to do. It's a, it's a skill we all practice. and. It's hard, and I'm in a career where it's, I do it all the time, and it's still hard. But you know, at Mount Holyoke, I was really challenged, um, and I worked really hard. Um, but in a space where you're doing it as yourself, and you're doing it in a way that you like want to do something like a hard thing, right? Like it's kind of like motivating to do it. Um, and so I think of that in terms of being authentically bold, right? And then. Um, the other part that I think you're, you're speaking a little bit to that I um, think about is I am in spaces often, we find ourselves in spaces where you're the only one or I'm the only blank group, check a box that I'm the only one in, right? And I, I recognize that, but I find that being at Mount Holyoke and then moving forward and even starting grad school at UMass that I, I would see it, but it didn't hurt me. It didn't make me shy away from the experience, right? I still raised my hand and asked my questions or I still pushed back, right? So again, at Mount Holyoke, you have this opportunity to see what's going on. But for me, it was like, okay, I see it, but I'm going to keep going, right? And that was something that parents instilled in me, but also really was read, like brought highly up in here at Mount Holyoke. That's great. So I know that our students in particular have come to ask some questions. So I want to open the floor for that purpose. Uh, so the floor is open. <laughs> yes. What do you do when you're in a situation and an opportunity comes up over your table that you know you cannot say yes to because you have prior commitment or prior research that you're trying to work on, which you know is a great opportunity? What do you do in those instances? Do you have this ability where you can say, no, I have something I need to focus on, or do you just say, scratch what I'm doing, this other opportunity opened up for me, and that's what I need to work on because that's my new passion? Hmm. The plate is already full. What do you do? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, a, a few things come to mind in that I don't typically, if, it, if something comes, an opportunity comes my, my way and it's like, super, it's really exciting, it's something I'd love to do, but my plate is full, um, I often will say, this is really exciting, it's something I wanna do, not now. Is it possible to do, right? And I actually said that to a pretty big project, uh, fall of 2020, because everyone was calling in 2020. And what's interesting is like, to not feel like all is lost, they ended up circling back to me a year later. They were like, are you, are you free now? Right, like so to know that it's okay to say no, right? But then I also wanna say something that I've learned is to have a no committee, so that sometimes I try not to let my plate get too full so that I leave room for other opportunities to come. And so when things come my way, I, I actually there was an opportunity that came my way, I have a committee of friends that I'll call to be like, all right, I want to say yes to this, you know, should I say yes to this? And, and they are the committee that helps me say no, because that's hard to do sometimes. 
And one time they were like, well, but if you let go of this other thing, you could do this. And it's like, well, that served its purpose. You're a full professor now. You don't have to continue to do this other thing. And that can allow you to, to do something else. So to me, what that also says is don't isolate yourself. Like use the people around you to help you figure out, like if this really is a passion project, can you reconfigure what's on your plate? Yeah. I agree. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Mount Holyoke, I found myself, it was very hard to say no, and it got overwhelming. Um, and since then, I've learned about the art <laughs> of saying no and feeling really like confident in saying no, um, even when it feels like, oh, this is really exciting. But I, in addition to saying um, no or maybe in a little bit, right, I, I can also say, you know, there's this other person that also would be really cool for it to be a part of this conversation, right? So you bring somebody else in who you know might have a little more space than you do, right? So saying no doesn't mean you have to cut off the opportunity altogether. And it also brings, brings up, so, you know, if I, I have um, graduate students that I'm mentoring, right? bring them into the project. They might maybe have less time than I do, but I say, hey, you want to be a part of this too, right? So there are ways to say no without losing contact with that opportunity. Yeah. Your saying that makes me think of sometimes when I've needed to say no and I say, call Kira. Right? <laughs> yeah. yeah, 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 that's, that's how I ended up on CNN for the first time. <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> Um, other questions? Yes. I found baby stories very fascinating. So I want to know when is the right time to talk to babies about race? Yeah, great question. <laughs> um, there's, there's never an, a bad time um, to bring up these constructs, right, of race. And w as adults, we don't give credit for how early they notice something, right? So it's never too early, but, it, but you just approach it in different ways, right? So, and we also think about it as, it's not just talking, it's experiencing, right? So bringing, as I said, it, you know, the earliest kind of shift in our brain and paying attention to faces is driven by your environment. So what we don't know is if our environment is maybe more racially diverse or racially integrated, how does that then maybe shift? How does that change the brain's shifting, right? So you may not necessarily be talking to a three-month-old, but you're giving them more faces to see. A, a face kind of diary is more diverse. But also, it's again another piece of that is Think about it, again, not just talking at, but about how we talk about people. What are the words that we're using? The labels that we're using are so powerful to the fact of how we shape our understanding of a face, right? So a very common kind of example is if we, in kindergarten or in preschool, a teacher says, boys and girls line up. What does that tell? everybody, that the words boys and girls or the concepts that define boys and girls are important. They navigate our lives, right? But if we were to say, you know, um, more specifically, you know, Kira, go stand at the front of the line, right? That's signaling that this person who is Kira, we need to know her individualness of Kira, and we want her to go stand in front of the line. So just by using different kinds of labels, again, is shifting the way the brain is processing and remembering what's important, right? And we can do that for constructs of gender, we do that with constructs of race. We think about the labels that we're using to identify people, greatly change these kinds of constructs and stereotypes about race. If we say, oh, all those people, or if to a three-year-old we say, oh, black people do this, black people wear this, or white people wear this kind of clothes, right? We're using a category label, but if we say, Joe wears this kind of clothes, we're individualizing it just to Joe. We're not creating a stereotype, right? So it's a great question. But I'm adding to it is experience and language. It's how we do it. Yeah. I saw a hand in the back at the same time that your hand was raised in the front. Was there a question in the back? Yeah. Hi. Yeah. 
Um, I'm just wondering, like, what or what something that's like kept you pushing or kept you motivated in times of challenges, mm. and to like for you to really feel secure in where you are now. Like, what's something that has kept you going to say, like, this is the opportunity for me. This is the career and journey that I want to be on. Mm. Support your no community for me, my, my no committee, right? So definitely support for me is, you know, having friends, family um, who can think through with you in the process of, you know, the, the, those, those hard moments, right? Um, whether it's a decision, a career decision, I actually came to you and we had a conversation, a really useful one, mm -hmm. right? Um, because other people can see the experience you're in in different ways that your mind can't quite capture yet, right? And so I think that's really been a valuable experience for me is having other people, not just to say, oh, you can do it, they raise you up, but just say, well, how do you think about it in this way, like a reframe or, you know, being, being able to kind of think creatively about that hard experience that you're having, right? And, and again, Mount Holyoke, doing an honors thesis or writing, you know, writing a thesis very much prepares you to <laughs> do your d dissertation, right, to do a PhD or what have you. So um, those are, yeah, I would say just having people there to help you think about the moment in a different way is really helpful. Mm -hmm. I think about something you said. You've told me, I remember when we did the live stream um, in 2020, you talked about hope being a discipline. Yes. And you say that often, but I remember that I heard it at that moment probably because it was summer of 2020. Mm -hmm. And um, there's something about like those hard times. I remind myself of that, that like life is not easy and that's okay because we can do hard things. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we learn the most about ourselves through those times. I've had a journey of, of weightlifting. Like I lift more consistently. I have at different times, but like I'm consistent about it for the past five years. And it has taught me so much about myself. And if you think about it, like with strength training, you don't always want to do it. It's hard. <laughs> you know, it'd be really easier just to not, <laughs> right? But there are lessons you can learn about yourself if you push yourself under pressure when in those moments where you want to give up but actually you want the gains, so you push through. And so like for me, the challenging myself in other ways, like I was in grad school and I thought I needed to run a marathon. I don't know why I thought I needed to do that. <laughs> but I, actually now I do. I think it was like the stretching myself of like, I should go do this other challenging thing. I'm doing this challenging thing over here. That might sound like I have real, <laughs> anyway, <laughs> we won't go there. <laughs> but I, I say that to say, what gives me that, like when things are hard, I remind myself that I can do hard things. And I think I've seen in my life, there are times where I intentionally put myself in hard thing scenarios to remind myself um, that you can do this. It's hard, but you can do this. And so those people around you are important, but also what you say to yourself in your own head is really important. Not to isolate yourself, but like, how do you stretch yourself and practice that. There's this book um, called, oh, I can't, I'm not gonna try to remember the name, but he talked about that it's a comfort crisis, that we as people in our, in our evolution, we're, we're really comfortable in this like 72 degree temperature, climate controlled, we don't really challenge ourselves. And there's like, I think it's an old Japanese tradi tradition of masojis, like going on these journeys where we think about like the Maasai, where you know, rites of passage, you go have this big journey, either you come back with a lion or you get eaten one by one or something like that. <laughs> That's probably not it, actually. <laughs> but, right, like, the idea is that you challenge yourself, you do something that you might fail at, like 50%, you might fail at this, but you learn about yourself through that process. So when I'm in those moments, I remind myself of the other times that I've come through hard things. And it's also, you know, just to, be real, it's ugly. <laughs> like when you do hard things, it can be really ugly, right? I mean, in terms of like, you know, the ugly crying and the, the like rage or whatever it is, right? It's, it's not, I, I don't want to come across as sitting here and be like, oh yeah, we can do hard things and we're like, we just do it, you know, it's hard. No, like it's, you know, there's, there's tears, there's, there's sweat, there's whatever, and that's okay if you do it. In, for me, I, if I make sure I am okay to have those emotions and these extreme experiences, but doing it in a way that feels still myself and still s feels healthy and 
you know, safe and I have that community of support and things like that, right? So, um, yeah, it's not like a pretty process. <laughs> <laughs> and don't let, I, I have found, I have two boys and so I talk to some of their friends and I have graduate students now, right? Like, and I will talk about as, as they apply for internship or go to these different points. So what I'm saying is these younger folks that I've talked to, I've heard some of them articulate that the manicured nature that you see other people's lives through Instagram and other sorts of social media, that it's hard for them to go through those hard things because you only see what people want you to see. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I think that's a very important point that it doesn't always look like everyone's life isn't what you see on Instagram mm -hmm. and that those are hard, it, it's, it's hard and that's okay. Yes. Hi. Hey. Um, thank you so much for being with us today and wonderful talks, a good number of stories. I was just wondering about how you like make decisions because like you got an offer from for being a professor at four different like colleges I believe and probably more, you deserve all of it. Um, how how do you like decide which one to do when mm. you haven't really like taken any of the position? Like, oh, I know how it's like being at Stanford, so I can take this position. Mm -hmm. But like what if you ha don't know anything about the environment? Like you, you can talk to people, you can understand, but then there's always a saying that, oh, whatever people say, take it with a bit grain of salt. Like mm -hmm. how much how do you just go about it? Mm. Decisions are not easy <laughs> for me. <laughs> I am, that was a, the career decision was a long, pro, like months. That was a very long process. Nothing that was, is ever done quickly. Um, I, as an extrovert, talk to people. I talk to everybody and I get all these different, you know, pieces and through that process I keep myself, but then I just keep, you know, like shuffling the data points, right? And kind of trying to find that like summary of like, okay, this is what I'm seeing. Here are the, you know, and, and when we spoke, um, we I even wrote out like visually, you know, here are the columns of the, the buckets of options and putting the different pieces in. So, um, you know, trying to, like I said, for me, it's a ex external processing. <laughs> it's, a, it's a lot for me for making those decisions. But you're, you're, the part of your question I think is really interesting and I'd like to hear from you too is this, ex this idea of making a decision about something or going towards something that you have no idea what it's going to be like. And I'm guessing many of us in this room have had that experience, whether it's choosing to come to Mount Holyoke, moving to South Hadley, Massachusetts. I mean, for me, I grew up in Amherst, so I, I knew what was going, to ha going on. <laughs> I, didn't, I wasn't too unsure I, I, about that part, but um, somebody had said to me, you know, um, a, gra a faculty at, um, in grad school, it's like, you don't have to know. Like, if you already knew, then you would already have the degree, right? Exactly. So, and the other thing for me is, like, I make a decision and I'm going to make that decision fully and then see how it goes and also realize like I can change that decision, yeah. right? There's always ways to say, mm, you know, turns out this wasn't the right choice or this is the direction I want to change, right? And I can still make it. So I think I really, and maybe that's a part of my like aversion to making decisions is that I'm always reminding myself that I could like change the decision that I then make. Mm -hmm. But I think that's a real thing, right? So. I yeah, I agree. And life is, uh, there's a researcher, actually she's a psychologist, I believe, Carrie Ann Rockamore, and she, she yes. has, right? So she talks about your life in chapters. Mm -hmm. And so to also remember that you can fully commit and make a decision and that could be a chapter and you could decide to write another chapter. Mm -hmm. I think about that even now because I, I, there's so much I want to talk to you about research and yet that's a piece of myself that takes up less space now because I'm doing more consulting, right? And even just like making that decision to have that be a chapter and this is a smaller part of this chapter and so don't feel like you have to, that this is the only decision that you'll have to make ever. Like, it's a decision and you know, a string of many and you can change. Yeah, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah thank you. Mm -hmm. You also had a question. Um, so I definitely resonated with what you said about being the only blank in a room. Mm -hmm. um, and I also agree that it doesn't necessarily stop me from you know, pursuing what I want to pursue or saying what I want to say, but it can still be disheartening. So what do both of you do in those instances? 
What do I do with that? Or how do you? Oh, how do, how you do I navigate it? How do I how manage it? That's a good, that's a good question. I don't know. It just is. <laughs> I'm the only black woman. I'm the first black woman to get tenure in my department in the 200 and whatever years of the institution's existence. You know, I'm the only black woman in the department, and um, I don't. I don't. I, I guess I navigate it by being authentically me, and I don't let it pull me down. Um, and I also don't shy away from reminding my colleagues of the shadow mentoring and other work that I do, that I happily do, um, but that I remind them, like as we make decisions around hires and other things, like if, if we are serious about changing the dynamics, right, that means making me not the only, right? Like, that, right? And so I, 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 that's actually a great question. Like, how do I navigate it psychologically? I don't, um, I don't give it my energy as a negative. It's simply a part of what's happening right now, and I, I try to navigate and be there for my students um, and give voice to it so that it doesn't, that we don't get complacent in the fact that I'm the only. I want to piggyback on that question, if I might. Something you said, Kira, um, prompted me to think about this. Uh, because, you know, you said it takes a, you know, it can take a lot out of you. That one, that was implied in your question, too. And a long time ago, someone said to me, if you make a lot of withdrawals, you better make a lot of deposits. <laughs> so, so, so my question to you is, both of you, how are you making deposits? Yeah, great. Um, you know, to this idea of making the deposits in your question, too, when I recognize that I am the only one in a certain scenario, right, so one is to be bringing it up to colleagues or whomever, but I also have to decide for myself when is it that I need to like take that on and make be the initiator of the change, but also, but or is it alerting somebody, hey, you recognize that this is, you know, we're, we don't have a balance here, or not even a balance, we just don't have representation, and saying, okay, you have that information and it's time for you to, you know, step up and do it. Because it, you cannot, in my opinion, you can't just take on everything, right? Because that takes away from yourself physically, emotionally, mentally, but it takes away from the research. For me, it would take away from the babies, <laughs> right? If I'm spending all my energy on addressing the shortcomings of a department, then I'm not actually doing the work that I want to be doing in some ways. So. I guess as a, a deposit, it's saying like, you identify it, I identify it, and then I encourage somebody else to do the movement. I will support them in that, but I need somebody else to kind of spearhead it, right? So if that's in the form of allyship, it, it could be. Um, and then, you know, the other thing that I've done, um, that I've experienced, maybe not necessarily seek it out all the time, but that I've experienced throughout my life is, having lots of different types of groups around me, right? So sometimes I'm a group where I am that only one, but I'm in other spaces where I'm a part of the numeric majority, right? So you have, by having that kind of mix for myself, that's giving me the different kinds of energy and deposits that I need. Yeah, I would agree with that. Just making sure that there are spaces where that's not the burden for me. And choosing joy. Like, so sometimes that might mean closing the computer and not doing work, not doing that second shift of work at night. Um, or like uh, this week, I have a lot of travel. And so it was President's Day on Monday, my kids were home, like we went to see a movie as a family, right? But choosing to make sure I make time for those people in my life that matter, because there will always be work to be done, <laughs> always. It won't go away. So that is something that I think, I don't know if I learned it at Mount Holyoke or in grad school, that like you can't wrap everything up. You can't finish everything. I had a supervisor in grad school tell me that work is like laundry. It'll always be there. <laughs> Kim Leary, who is at Amherst, right. Right, so even if you finish all your laundry, and even if you put it all up, even if, you're still wearing something and you're creating more, right? Yeah. So if you can have that attitude towards it, like it shouldn't stress you out as much that there's still work to be done. Because there's still laundry, but eh, you know, we'll get to it. And of course, I know any Mount Holyoke person in this room isn't gonna like totally shirk their duty. So I can say this to you, right? Like it'll get done. It'll get done 
And sometimes it's just important to remind yourself of that and not feel like you have to wrap everything up. Mm-hmm. Yes? Um, in terms of your, both of your research, I'll have noted from what you've said that it started, a lot of it started in a more micro sense in terms of like individual fixes and changes and improvement. But as you guys are continuing your research and as you're moving into consultancy, how do you see the potential macro um, effects that your research can have on the, the larger scale? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's a both and for me. I've always had two tracks of like, I do this research so that we can help people navigate discrimination and I do this consulting so we can stop discriminating because that would be the best way for people to navigate discrimination, right? It's just to stop it, cut it out. Stop, it. stop being hateful. So to end all systems of oppression, is the macro stuff. And so I see it as, a, as like this both ends. So there's this one research pro project that I've been working on that's, um, uh, that's centered in black women and this idea we have in, in clinical psychology, this act, act therapy is this idea that you can have, you can get fused with ideas about who you are. So I could get fused with this idea that I'm not good enough, that they'll find me out, that I'm an imposter, and that we can use psychological intervention to create distance between self and that concept and that that can help decrease psychological distress and free you up, right? And so we did this, this group protocol with black women and, and were able to see that using these interventions that we created could help them decrease their ideas of appropriated, I call it appropriated racism. Like, so you pick up these ideas that racism tells you that sexism, that heterosexism tells you about who you're supposed to be. Um, and so I'm sharing that quickly to say, I do that research but then I also am called into companies to do listening sessions with black employees. And I can like real time help them name some of the ideas and narratives that they've been told about who they are in this company, in the world, right? And help them disconnect. And so there's a real way in which I find it's fun to be able to play in both the micro and the macro um, if you can allow yourself to apply what you learn in your research. Yeah. Awesome. For me, I, there are a couple of ways that I kind of think about that and how I'm, again, still trying to establish it. But um, one is that by having families interact with me, they have their infant participate in a study. It, it could just be this like one-off experience. Parents don't think much about it ever again. But I want to be able to do it in a way and communicate the, share back what we're you know, finding in a way that maybe just a little small change, right, in that parent's approach to maybe they go to a library events more often or they choose to, um, you know, become more aware of the labels, the names that they're using, right? And, and yes, it's individual changes, but if we think about then larger ripple changes, right? And um, of course, it's, Sometimes it feels hard because you're like, oh, well, like, that's just like one or a handful of families that you get to see that make that change. But, you know, I want to think that there's still, you know, changes being made. But the other thing is that um, looking to kind of the way researchers, academics interact with media, for my work, you know, I look at um, the importance of word using different kinds of labels. Well, I could talk to toy companies or I could talk to, you know, those who are building or writing um, books. I have a colleague who's starting an app, right? And I mean, now we can, I think, you know, there's a lot more opportunity for creativity to send out into making those like larger scale changes. But for me, again, it's, I really do think about the individual experience and changes for the families that I interact with. And given the way that the research is done right now, a lot of those families are primarily, um, you know, uh, highly educated white families who can come in and do research in the middle of the day. <laughs> but, you know, those, and those are the families that we actually want making changes. <laughs> so, you know, that's, that's, again, I'm hoping that the individual experiences kind of lead into larger changes. Sharice, I know that, um the baby research is interesting in a lot of ways, but for those who haven't really experienced it or read about it, yeah. could you just talk about like, how do you know what a baby knows, <laughs> right? Right, yeah. yeah. Just how do you that? figure out something that somebody who can't verbally tell you right, what's going exactly. on? Right, exactly. Yeah. Um, 
Well, in your intro, you mentioned some uh, kind of fancy sounding words of yes, yes. Um, electroencephalography. So this idea of recording brain activity um, is one way that we can kind of think, start to explore what's going on in a, in a baby's mind. Um, but there are also ways that we can set up a game. We, we're doing games, you know, the idea is that for it to be fun, right? You can't get a one-year-old to do something that's not necessarily fun. And as a researcher, you learn to try to control your variables, right? You control what factors you want to change and then the factors that you need to keep constant, right? And so then we're looking for a change in behavior in a 10-minute visit, right? In a 10-minute visit, I want to be able to show them a, a picture of one kind of face and another picture of a different kind of face. And I'm looking for a change in that infant's behavior to those two faces. And I can do that by putting a hat, a little hat on their heads and recording the brain signal that's um, the, at the scalp level. Or I can do that by watching their um, eye movement when they see the faces. And I can also do that by seeing their motor actions. Do they choose one toy over the other depending on whose face is associated with that toy? Right, so we, as developmentalists, I try to capitalize what infants can do, right? So that we know that they have preferences, mm -hmm. right? And so how do they show us preferences? They go towards something or they look longer towards something. So I use those abilities to then show them faces or objects or things like that. So it's, it's a, you know, 10, 10 minute experience for the infant. But for me, it's a, that's a massive amount of you know, information to try to go back. So then there's, you know, you go back and you watch the video of the session or things like that. So, um, you know, usually you come to the lab, but I have ways where we can go to a daycare mm -hmm. and interact with infants in that capacity as well. Thank you. We have time maybe for one or two more questions. And I want to invite faculty members. I know we've got a lot of faculty members who've been deferring to students, and that was appropriate. <laughs> um, but uh, in these few minutes, if there are any of our faculty members who want to ask a question of our psych ed graduates, feel free. Yes, go for it. It's so nice to hear you saying so many things I needed to hear today. Um, oh, good. I'm the psych ed department, which is mostly in this area, I think. <laughs> um, but as a, and I, uh, most of my work is in education, and so I'm thinking a lot about myself as an educator and how, to, how, how much pressure is too much pressure on students. What was, how did the ways in which your faculty push you, how did that help you, and what are maybe things we shouldn't be doing? Hmm. So what's helpful as faculty, what's not? What's helpful, hmm. what's not? <laughs> <laughs> well, your, your point about Mount Holyoke challenging you, um, I got my first B minus here. It was devastating. <laughs> devastating to my ego. But Linda Morgan, it was uh, African American. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, course, you, did, you, did you remember this? Do you remember this conversation? Uh, no. I've had this experience. Well, and, no. <laughs> it was so important. It was so important. And I was like, well, why? And you told me all the reasons why. And that was so important to me because I had not, like, the, I, I could have a whole, we could have a whole conversation after this about why I think this could have happened. Um, but I'll fast forward. I had students in my class, in particular, there was one young black man that I remember who had the guts to come to me and say, Dr. Banks, are you being harder on us because we're black? There's some of us who think you are. And I said, no, I'm sorry if someone never took the time to tell you what needed to improve in your writing, but this is what I expect from everyone, and this is what you need to improve in your writing. And it was because of you uh -huh. and because of the way that I was pushed. And like, sure, it's good enough, but you can do better, right? Like, where's I, more, more evidence? So that was, that's important. And that's hard as a faculty member because that feedback takes time. I, and I tell my students that feedback is a gift of my time. And so really, I hope you hear it. <laughs> like it really, it's easier to grade good papers than, hard, than papers oh, that aren't sure. good, right? Right. So you taught me that. And so keep doing that. Give the feedback even when they, we, didn't, we weren't happy about it. <laughs> um, that's, what I'll, that's where I'll start. Yeah, I mean, tough feedback. 
Amber. <laughs> <laughs> Many, many of those conversations, they raise up, you know, get, get going here on your writing, right? So, I mean, those are, that's, those are the important things. And um, so, doing it in a way that says, like, it, the, the message was, you can do this, and you need to. <laughs> so, figure it out, right? Like, you need to do this. Yeah. Um, and then, um, and I know that one of the kind of questions that maybe you were kind of thinking about was like people that were impactful or inspiring, yes. but yeah. um, in the same kind of idea what you're asking about like things to do is to also go to a student and identify when they are really succeeding, right? When they're doing things that you are excited about. Um, and Lucas did that um, in my first, year at Mount Holyoke and um, in his course and you know I was at office hours and you know he s really communicated like that in this particular paper that I wrote I was really crossing all the T's dotting the I's and in a way that was exciting to him that was very clear to me that how excited he was about the things that I was saying or writing um, and in that conversation um, uh, also, he had said, you know, I want a student like you to come back and teach at Mount Holyoke. Now, in that moment, I was like, no. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what my face did, but like, I don't have a poker face. So it's probably did something like, hmm, right? Mm. <laughs> so, you know, and, but don't listen to your 18-year-old self, I guess. Um, and uh, that message has stuck with me. Um, you know, I went to grad school and I didn't, again, I didn't really think I was going to go into academia. I really, like, did not go to grad school to become a professor. I just went because it was an opportunity to do something hard, I guess. But, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm, but I am now in academia and I didn't come back to Mount Holyoke yet, but, you know, it's a, a message that has here. really, right here. yeah, <laughs> I mean. <laughs> the hiring committee yeah. right over there. <laughs> but um, it was a message that still, I mean, from 2004 to now, it really stuck with me. Yeah. That's fabulous. You should come back. <laughs> we have a vote over here. Um, so I know that we probably should wrap so that we can continue our conversation informally over our dinner, which we'll be waiting for us soon. But I want to just ask at this, as we close, um, what advice you have, you know, for your younger self? You've been giving a lot of advice already, but if you could, you know, in 25 words or less, um, <laughs> what would you share? Or something that you haven't already talked about that you think, I can't leave here without also saying this. Uh, many of you think of, uh, like I said, this har doing hard things. But finding moments to do silly things and to just laugh and breathe and kind of wait, ride these different um, emotional waves that we have, I think is something, and it, I don't know if it's necessarily don't take yourself too seriously, but laugh and enjoy and find that kind of happiness and lightness. Um, I think I wish I had done more of that while doing hard things. I agree. Don't wait until to have fun, to have joy. Have it while you're doing those hard things. I would agree. And the other thing I'd say is the hard work pays off. You might not be able to see it today, but I was sharing with you, I was in a consultation about a, about a scene, and they were talking about kind of African diasporic they were doing a scene and, and they were talking about what food was going to be at the table for the ancestors, right? And, and it was only because of all the different classes that I had at Mount Holyoke and the reading that I do broadly that in the moment as a cultural consultant I could say no to this, yes to that. And so like that's pulling out stuff from the recesses of my brain that some people would have to go research. But it's so like the reading that you're doing in a class that's not your major, soak it in, get excited about it. It pays off. It'll feed you in a way that you can't know now, but like all of that knowledge is worth it and is important. Yes. Please join me in thanking our two fabulous visitors. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>